Speaking of liberty, the National Broadcasting Company presents another in a special series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. There was free talk in the old New England town hall and around the Cracker Barrel in the Crossroads store, and there's free talk by free men every week at this time, led by our host, Rex Stout. You may already know Rex Stout as the author of intriguing detective stories featuring the master criminologist, Nero Wolfe. On this program, you will get to know him even better as an outspoken champion of our American democracy. Mr. Stout. Thank you, George Putnam, and good evening again to all lovers of liberty. If this were a quiz program, I'd like to start the discussion today by asking all of you listeners a very simple question. What's a newspaper? Of course, that's a little like asking how big is a rock, but I'd be willing to give attractive odds that I'd get almost as many different answers as there are listeners. A whole lot of people would say that a newspaper is a publication where you find the news, and that a good newspaper is one that gives you as much news as possible and as fully, as fairly, and as accurately as may be. Other people would say that a newspaper is where they find their entertainment and mention comic strips and special features. And still others, housewives maybe, who always examine the ads before they go shopping, would say that their newspaper is their chief source of invaluable buying information. But there's still another point of view, a more serious one. And because such questions as the freedom of the press and the proper functioning of a newspaper in a democracy are very important right now, we've invited Herbert Agar to come here this evening to discuss it. Mr. Agar is an author, a poet, a prophet of the Fourth Estate, and the editor of the Louisville Courier Journal. So I'm going to begin by asking him my question. Mr. Agar, what's a newspaper? I know how you'd like me to answer that, Mr. Stout. You indicated that clearly a few minutes ago before we went on the air. You feel a newspaper is where you go for news. That's right, I do. But what do you think? And you feel also, I imagine, that if your newspaper gives you fairly complete coverage, fairly and impartially, it's doing its whole job well. Right again. But I still want to know what your answer is. What, Mr. Agar, is a newspaper? Well, I'll use the familiar dodge of answering one question by asking another, Mr. Stout. Why is journalism the one form of private enterprise to be mentioned by name in the Bill of Rights? Because freedom of the press is one of the fundamental principles of democracy, is one way of saying it. Of course. But if running a newspaper is just a business like any other business, like selling shoes or insurance or manufacturing widgets, why did the founding fathers single it out for such importance? You mean why did they guard it so carefully? Yes. Why did they confer on the press or the newspaper business, if you like, this special right, this privilege, which is enjoyed by no other business? Well, for one thing, you could say with a certain amount of truth, because newspapers in the 18th century were much more pamphlets of opinion than what we know as newspapers today, and that what the founding fathers were protecting was the right of printing and publishing one's own opinion rather than the news business. Yes, you can take that point of view, and I'd like to suggest another. It seems to me that the answer to the question is that society conferred a special right or privilege upon the press in the belief that the press would pay society back by finding and publicizing the sort of truth that makes men free. Then your point is that the right was conferred in the expectation that the press would live up to certain responsibilities and obligations. That's the only reason for ever conferring a right, Mr. Stout. All rights are, in fact, privileges, and when the responsibilities and obligations are ignored, democracy can't help suffering. Do you mean that a newspaper should be a sort of spur to the public conscience? Yes. Or rephrasing that a little, I'd say that one of the chief functions of a newspaper in a democracy, in addition to providing full and accurate news, is constantly reminding the people of the truth, and very often of the sort of truth they don't want to hear. For example? Oh, for example, the public likes to hear of corruptions and failings in far-off countries, or even in far-off sections of its own country. The maltreatment of Negroes in the South is a safe subject for newspapers in Boston. And the pruderies and fancies of New England censorship can be attacked with great bravery in New Orleans. The public doesn't like a daily reminder of problems on its own doorstep, plus a daily reminder of what ought to be done about them. Well, allowing the validity of your idea of the obligations of the press, Mr. Agar, practically speaking, how do you think it has worked out? Not too well. Even the papers which do the best and most honest news covering are apt to be timid when it comes to editorial comment. When it comes to interpreting the news in the light of what ought to be happening if we were living up to our American ideal, the papers tend to encourage us in complacency, which is a dangerous mood for a democracy. I think this failure of the papers to do the hard job is one of the reasons for the state of democracy today. 
One of the reasons, perhaps, why freedom has been almost everywhere abolished and why the ancient rule of slavery is returning to our world. But you don't think that's all the fault of the press, do you? No, there's fault on the other side, too, Mr. Stout. If the press has helped the public to neglect its duties, that's largely because that's what the public wants. The news business is catering to the public taste, just like the butter business. But the butter business gets no special protection from the Constitution, and the news business does. And to my way of thinking, that special protection carries with it very definite obligations. Well, granting the problem, what can be done to correct the situation? Do you think it would be helped by a system of censorship or some kind of control? Definitely not. The moment you introduce any kind of exterior control, except control by the force of public opinion, freedom of the press is gone for good. And whether you're right in saying that the proper business of the press is news, or whether I'm right in thinking that the press should also be a sort of public conscience, Freedom of the press is still one of democracy's best hopes and proudest possessions. Even if I think the press hasn't always lived up to its freedom, we can't do without that freedom. Agreed. If one basic freedom goes, they all go. The cure for what I regard as a bad situation has to be a moral cure, Mr. Stout. I wish the public would demand a better press to keep it more completely aware of what's going on. Then in your view, the readers in a democracy can and do influence the press. Indeed they do. You should read the letters to the editor that come to my desk in every mail. I'd like to ask two questions on that. Number one, do you as editor pay any attention to them? And number two, when they're printed in the editorial page, does anybody read them but the people who wrote them? Yes, on both points. The newspaper pays very close attention to what its readers think, especially on controversial questions. And as far as our readers are concerned, I can tell you that whenever we conduct a poll of most popular features, the letter to the editor column is always among the first three. It isn't only one of the most popular features, it's one of the ways in which the readers can feel that they themselves are a part of the newspaper. And also, it's enormously important that people who dislike what the paper is saying have a chance to express their dislike. The more positive the editorial policy is, the more letters you get. The letters increase because a definite policy is taken. One of the most encouraging things about being an editor is getting a response from people who like you and people who hate you. It makes you feel that what you say has some effect on their minds. Today, when great issues are at stake, the reader should express his opinions vigorously. But coming back to the question of control, you feel that you can't make the press better by passing a law. No, certainly not. Any law to control the press would be worse than no control at all. If anyone doesn't believe that, all he has to do is to examine the condition of the press in Europe. With the single exception of Switzerland, it isn't a press at all. It's just a house organ for dictatorship. Pap and propaganda. And speaking of propaganda, Mr. Agar, how much of it do you think is leaking through into our American newspapers? American editors are faced with that problem all day long. All we can say is we can't guarantee that the news that comes from any given place is accurate. This is the news that comes in. We have warned you before, and we must remind you again that the Axis powers make a habit of doctoring the news and even of manufacturing news that happens to suit their purpose. And then the reader has to sort things out for himself. Yes, and in this same general question of propaganda that comes to us from abroad, you have to consider the position of American correspondents, because that's where most of our foreign news comes from. Of course, their dispatches are all subject to rigid censorship. Yes, and to censorship of a pretty subtle kind. As Dr. Goebbels is never tired of telling us, censorship does not exist in Germany. On the other hand, he distinguishes very carefully between fair and unfair news dispatches. Fair dispatches are stories which conform to general Nazi news policy as developed at the daily press conferences of the Foreign Office or the Ministry of Propaganda. Really, of course, they're nothing more than stories published in the controlled German press or released through the official agencies. What happens when an American correspondent tries to find out things for himself? He's asked to leave the country. All personal investigation, use of private news sources, really independent reporting, come under the general classification of unfair dispatches. That's what happens in a dictatorship, Mr. Stout. The objective reporting which our foreign correspondents have given us in the past is impossible under conditions in Europe today. After an American correspondent has been asked to leave and has done so, He can give us the truth, and our newspapers have run some excellent articles of this sort recently, revealing what goes on behind the wall of Nazi censorship. Of course, the people who have to depend on the controlled press of Europe are denied the truth. It all comes back to the fundamental philosophy of the Nazis, 
which says that the only way to run a world is to have a few masters who direct the many slaves. So they organize and distort all news that comes in from every source for one purpose, that is, to degrade the mind to the level of slavery, to destroy all freedom of speech and opinion. And if we don't want it to happen here, what are we going to do about it? What's the answer, Mr. Egar? The only answer for free men anywhere is to value the freedom we have more than ever before and to demand greater freedom. We want a press that is free and critical, spurring us on to live up to the ideals of democracy. What about England? Wouldn't you say that the press of Great Britain is still free and still critical? It's doing a good job, sure. Even in the middle of what is literally a life and death fight for existence, it is free, and that's a real triumph of democracy under the sharpest kind of stress. Although news which would be of military value to the enemy has to be controlled, of course, the British press is still critical, is still free to pry out weaknesses, to demand reforms. And the news that comes to us from Britain shows us that they still believe over there, that there's no force so powerful as truth. There's one more question I'd like to ask you, Mr. Agar, still on the matter of propaganda. We all know that the Nazis have been carrying on a propaganda offensive, using it as a strategic weapon to supplement their military offensive. In judging communiques and stories from European sources as we read them in our newspapers, can you give us some pointers on ways to sort out the false from the true? Well, every story with an Axis dateline has to be read pretty warily with their objective in mind, to create dissension here in America and doubt of democracy's power to resist fascism. There are certain phrases which are used again and again in their references to this country. Pluto democracy, American imperialism, for example. They try to promote disunity among groups and classes and distrust of our leadership. Their comments on the president's speech last week were designed to show that there was very little popular support for his stand and that America is filled with tension and discord. Yes, and of course it isn't only stories with Axis datelines that should be read warily. For instance, all large American papers have a representative in Washington and their stories naturally tend to reflect the attitude of the paper in national and international problems. Newspaper reader needs to be on guard everywhere, and he also should read widely in order to get the whole truth. I think the news coverage in many of our papers is good, and it's getting better. I think in a number of our papers, the attempt to be impartial in news telling is fairly steady, and it's getting steadier. But I think the editorial policy, not only in editorial comment, but in the choice of the sort of news that is safe to comment on, tends to be timid and vacillating and dangerous to democracy at this hour of democracy's agony. I don't think, for example, that the press has done its job in keeping the American people steadily aware of the mortal danger to America today. I think most pa papers know more of that danger than they call attention to, because people don't like to hear too much bad news. The press, thank heaven, is still free. And because it is free, it can help to save America. But not by helping to make America feel more safe than the facts warrant. Complacency has often been the death of freedom. Thank you, Mr. Agar. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this evening is Herbert Agar, editor of the Louisville Courier-Journal. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. You have just heard the eighth of a special series of programs entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you each week at the same time by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, a national organization dedicated to the propagation of an American faith in democracy. Next week, Rex Stout will bring Max Eastman to the microphone. A copy of the script of this broadcast will be mailed free to anyone requesting it. The Council will also be glad to send information on its activities to any listener on request. Please address your letter or your card to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. Speaking of Liberty has been presented as a public service by NBC and the independent radio stations associated with the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company and has come to you from the RCA building, Radio City, New York.